All right, I think we'll get started. Um, the title of this talk is uh, Digital Vengeance. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to be exploiting some of what I consider the most common or most uh, notorious rats out there. So we'll be popping some shells in this talk. Um, originally, I gave this talk at Black Hat and DEF CON, and at that time, the exploits I was disclosing were zero days. Obviously, now they're like 60 days, but uh, the exploits, to the best of my knowledge, I haven't seen them patched, so they're still uh, available to be used, and all of these exploits are now in Metasploit itself. I've got them pushed upstream, so at the end of this talk, you can go take the exploits and start playing with them yourselves. Um, but uh, this talk, the exploits, I mean, they're cool. They're exploits in rats so that you can you know, hack back per possibly, but uh, I don't think their exploits are like super novel or you know, I'm super amazing or anything. The, the takeaway from this talk, if anything, is that the rats that are used by a lot of actors or nation state groups actually aren't that secure and that this is an area that I would encourage anybody who's re interested in vulnerability discovery to look at some of the hacking tools because a lot of hacking tools I feel like have vulnerabilities. I only looked at three, the top three on my list, but I would assume just based on the patterns that I was seeing that all of the tools have kind of very vulnerabilities that can be used. Uh, a little bit about me in the background. I work for Symantec. I am a threat researcher, so I am dealing with malware day in, day out. Before that, I worked for the Department of Defense doing uh, vulnerability discovery. And um, even before that, I've spent some time as an IT manager, so I've done some time in the trenches. I kind of know what it's like to, to live on the other end of these attacks. I feel like I kind of have a broad understanding of this area. Um, but with that background, it, it shouldn't be a surprise that uh, there's a few disclaimers I have to, to say before we get started. Number one. Uh, anything I'm voicing up here is my own opinion, and it's not the opinion of my current or former employers. Um, anything that you decide to do with what I am going to disclose with you is at your own risk. Uh, it probably is illegal to hack back, but um, if you do, I'd love to hear what you find. <laughs> I think it's an interesting area, but like I said, please don't hold me accountable if you decide to go get in trouble with these. Um, what really got me started down this path was some of the quotes I would hear in the industry about sophisticated actors, right? I feel the term gets used as an excuse a lot in the industry that, oh, because they were sophisticated, we couldn't block it, or, or there's no way we could have held up against them. We were just going to get compromised them at, at some point or another, right? Uh, there was one quote in there that the, mal the FBI cyber division says that this malware probably would have got, back, not, got past 90% of the companies anyway. So don't, you know, it's like, a, don't feel bad. It, it's, it's okay, it's okay. It's, it's not okay to have a defeatist attitude in the security industry. And I don't feel like, I mean, it's just self-demeaning and it doesn't do us any good. And uh, furthermore, I wanted to really show that these sophisticated actors are not so untouchable as the, the community or some people want to persuade, pers show, and that really that they can be hacked and they play on the same playing field that we do. So that was really my drive in, in researching this area. Now, hacking back is a topic that's been around for a long time, right? Five years ago at Black Hat, they did an anonymous survey and they asked people, have you engaged in some form of hacking back? And over one third of those interviewed said, yes. So it happens, it's going on. Nobody, nobody talks about it, right? They're kind of afraid of uh, the remorse, what would happen. But uh, the feeling generally is, is that law enforcement's not doing enough, so people have to take it on in their own hands. And, and to be fair, I don't know how much law enforcement actually could do, right? This is a global problem, not a US only bounds, and so that their jurisdiction's limited. But um, it's definitely something that, that people want something to be done, but nobody's quite sure how to do it the right way. Um, add to this a uh, draft by a, a Senator Tom Graves out of uh, Georgia. Just this year, he's drafted a bill known as the ACDC Act. I love the acronym. Um, the Active Cyber Defense Certainty Act, which would allow hacking back under certain circumstances. So if, if this bill were to pass, then this would dramatic, dr dramatically change our environment. However, if that were to pass, most people feel like hacking back is a very, very bad idea. It's one of those games you can't really win in the end, right? Um, if you were to hack back, 
It's probably illegal, first off. But even if, you, even if it wasn't, what are you hoping to gain? You can't really steal your own documents back, right? People, I mean, Hollywood movie stars all know, once photos are leaked on the internet, if you try to remove them, it just makes things a bigger mess. And the same thing's true for documents. If you've had something stolen via a hack, you can't go delete them off their server and know that they're gone for good. So you really can't steal your stuff back. Plus, you run a high risk. What if the company, what if who you hacked back was the wrong target and now you've involved a third party? Or what if you damage something in, in transit or on the way that's not related, then you have, um, you have other issues. What if they decide, since you hack them, then they're gonna double, you know, they come at you double strong or, or twice, as, twice as much, and then you've got an even worse problem than you had in the beginning. And uh, not to mention that all this effort you're wasting trying to hack them back could have been better used actually just locking down your systems and preventing the issue in the first place. So in general, hacking back to get your revenge, which is kind of what I feel like the most, uh, most common reason for hacking back is, probably isn't that valuable of a resource. But there are circumstances where I feel like hacking back can be very useful, but it's not for revenge cases. See, as a security analyst, Attribution, right? That's what they always get us for is like, well, who did this attack? Well, doing that is really hard, just looking at the evidence and the, the files. But if we were allowed to hack back and just observe the attacker, then we can observe how they work, who they're targeting, what kind of documents they're interested in. And that information is very valuable for doing attribution. You can get a, better, a much better idea of who the attacker is, what are they after, and how they work. So I think that would be the most beneficial use for hacking back. Not so much as revenge, right? Like even if you got on their box and deleted their files or something, they're just going to spin up another one somewhere else. Um, but if you sat and watched, I feel like that's where the most gain is here. And truth be told, the ACDC Act actually has this kind of verbiage in it. It says that, one, you are not allowed to hack back to destroy or, or delete information or cause any kind of physical or financial injury to your assailant. Instead, the only reasons you can hack back are to um, establish attribution and to monitor the behavior of a hacker, of the attacker. So this is specifically to help law enforcement. And furthermore, before you begin, engage in any type of hacking back, it says that you, you know, must uh, inform the government or the FBI that you plan to, and this is what you plan to attack, and you know, here's what you plan to do. And so, as a side effect of that, you're also informing the, FB, the government that you have been hacked, right? You can't hack back without first being compromised. So it's kind of a win-win in that sense. Is the FBI actually gets to get some of this insight that they were they've been hoping for for a long time to know how bad some of these threats are. And then you are allowed to hack back with certain stipulations. So the bill itself is actually very well drafted, um, especially for something on such a controversial topic. But... Um, Obviously, you didn't come here to hear me talk about ethics or legal or what you think I, we should do, right? Uh, the course of this talk is mainly about the exploits. So we'll leave those aside for the moment and just assume that if this law were to pass, all of these actions that I'm going to now disclose would be legal. So this is what would be capable were, this, were the law to change today. Um, before I get too far into things, I want to make sure I have some terminology clear. Um, in the... To CNC world, I've heard sometimes the component that runs on a victim is called the server piece, and the client is actually an attacker. I don't like that terminology, um, and I can't use the attacker and the victim, because since we're going to be attacking the attacker, then they become the victim, and the terminology gets really confusing. So I'm going to try to use three terms to describe the, the, the three different groups in here, and I, I'm not very good at staying with my uh, de decision, but I'll, I'll try to keep this. So the original victim, the one who was targeted by the attacker, I'm going to call it the target. The, the guy who controls the rat, I will call the adversary. And the one who is hacking back, which would be us in this case, I'm going to call the retaliator. I like the term retaliator because the dic dic dictionary definition is one who returns assault in kind. And that's what we'll be doing. We'll be hacking the hacker. So uh, I really like that term. And um, for getting started, a colleague of mine uh, about a year ago now, posted this tweet. He had taken all the APT reports that had been published, and he kind of ran some static um, uh, statistics on them and said that these are the tools that are most referenced from top to bottom in 
nation state or sophisticated actor attacks. So these are the tools that they most commonly use. And I felt, hmm, well, this is a great shopping list for me. I'm just going to start at the top one, see if I can find an exploit on it, and then move my way down one by one. Um, however, if some of you are familiar or aware, um, the top one on that list, Poison Ivy, there is actually already an exploit for it. This is the, the Poison Ivy page. Poison Ivy has since been discontinued. The developer has not made any updates for it for quite some time. But a few years ago, uh, the two individuals here at the bottom, I'm not going to try to pronounce their names because I would just murder it, but they wrote a buffer overflow exploit against the RAT server. And that has been published to Metasploit. It's actually in everybody's Metasploit copy at this time. Now, along the same lines, a few years ago, Mandiant released their APT1 report. And in that report, they note, they mentioned that, that this attacker uses poison ivy. Um, a different group known as malware LU noticed, hey, these guys use poison ivy. I have an exploit for poison ivy. I think I'm going to try this out. So they reached out to the local CERT team, told them what they're planning to do, and then they went, went ahead and did it. And they released this report publicly of what they found. This is one of the rare cases where somebody who hacked back publicly documented it. And what they found was very interesting. This picture on the very right is, a, is a, an image of how they mapped out the infrastructure of this attacker. They show that the attacker uses a number of VMs for doing the actual exploitation and a targeting of their victims, and that they only tech, connect to those VMs via a proxy, so they're trying to protect their own identity even on their own systems. So they, did, they have a very, very big system. Um, Malware AU not only got on the boxes, but they were able to pull additional tools that this attacker used and, and reference them and gave it the SHAs and the HASs and signatures for them so that we as defenders could not only know that the one main tool that they used, but the others as well. It was very insightful and it provided a lot of good information for those defending. So I think this is one of the great um, case studies showing hacking back can be very useful for defenders. Another one on that list, uh, not on the top, but it was on the list as well, so I figured I should mention it. Dark Comment also had an exploit for it already. This one uh, has, it would allow you to pull a file off of the ad adversary's machine. And one of the key files that people pull is the database from the RAT tool. Um, I have no, I've not found any site of this being used publicly or anybody uh, published any documents. I'm sure it's probably being used, but nobody's actually talked about it publicly. And with those out of the way, let's start talking about the new stuff. Um, the, the three I'm going to, I just started on that list on ones that were not already exploited and I worked my way down. However, in this talk, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about them from third, second, first. So I'm going to talk about what I feel like is the least interesting and move up to the most interesting, the most common rat and the vulnerabilities I found in them. So the first one on my list, or, or, or the third one that I talked, want to talk about, is uh, Extreme Rat. Extreme Rat is a remote administrative tool. This is a screenshot of it. I have one victim there, and I right-clicked on the victim, and these are the functions that I can do to that victim, right? I can try to steal their passwords. I can go make, send them to a URL. I can search for certain keywords. I can start a keylogger. I can pull files. I can run commands. It's, it's kind of the standard Rat-type functionality. This, uh, you see a screenshot of the victim over here, where they're located in the world, and their you know, hard drive or, or their system information here. This tool actually is written more for the script kitty, though. It's not a professional or, or a nation state or sophisticated actor type tool. Um, one of the key features in this rat is uh, in case you get bored, there's Jewel Quest or you know, these flash games built in, I guess. If you're not very good at writing phishing emails, then while you're waiting for your adversary, your, your target to click on that phishing email link, you can play some jewel quest waiting for them to come back. But nonetheless, Extreme Rat has been cited in numerous uh, targeted attacks. A lot in the Gaza Strip, uh, Syria. Um, we can see among, uh, let's see, what, well, what else was there? Yep, Israel is hit as well with this tool quite a bit. It's, it's hit, it's used quite a lot. So it's an off-the-shelf tool, but a lot of sophisticated actors like to use it. The easiest way to identify this in your traffic is how it calls home. It can call home one of two ways. The usual way is a TCP connection. And that TCP connection starts out with a string, my version, pipe, 
and then the version number of the tool. So it's either 3.6 or 7 or 8. Those are, those are the most release, recent versions. And then the server responds with a X character, that, that's the 58 hex, and then a line feed. Um, that's a very signatureable pattern. You can you know, make a snort signature or whatever on that. And if you see that, then you know you've been compromised by this extreme rat. The other option it can do is it can do a fake HTTP request to call home. And it always takes the form of a get request slash some number, some 10 digit number dot functions. Um, that 10 digit number is actually the password that the adversary uses when they start up extreme rat. And that password must be all digits. So it's a very easy to make like a regex pattern for that URL. And if you see that URL, then again, it's another sign that extreme rat has uh, gotten onto your network somehow. So I started playing with the server and, and the, uh, the client side piece. And one of the things I found interesting is how the code works for the adversary to, to um, push a file down to the target. So the, the server component says, hey, get ready to receive my file called tool.bad, and I want you to save it to C drive temp.calc.exe. And then the target component will respond and say, all right, I'm ready to receive your file called tool.bad. And then the server component says, here's the data. That you, and then you know, the target will then save that to the disk and then presumably run that shortly thereafter. But there's an interesting piece in this, is that why is the victim's machine, why is the target need to know where the file is stored at on the, server, on the attacker's machine at all? Why is tool.bad even revealed to the target. Um, it's a small information disclosure. I know your path, but, but I thought about why is that even in there at all? And I thought the only reason that's probably in there is so that the adversary component of the server piece doesn't need to remember any state. The response from the target that says, I'm ready to receive tool.bad is all that the server needs to know to then start sending the beta. So I thought, I wonder if we actually skip the first part and if I just, out of the blue solicit, hey, I'm ready to receive this file from you, then sure enough, the server component will say, okay, here's this file. Yeah, I must, have, I must have said you needed that, and it just hands me the data. So I could request any file I wanted off of the server's machine, and it will give it to me. The only problem is, is I don't know what files I want to grab. I can't grab a whole directory, but I can grab something. Um, this is known as a blind file retrieval bug, and it comes up a lot in pen testers. So pen testers have thought about this quite a bit. And that uh, this, uh, this URL at the bottom kind of highlights things you might want to grab if you have a blind file retrieval bug. Um, first thing you might want to grab is windows.ini. That file should exist on any version of Windows. And you would grab that as mainly a sanity check just to make sure this is actually working. If that works, then you can tell the version of Windows and then you would know where the event logs are. So you can start pulling event logs off that machine. Because event logs will tell you lots of things. Presumably, you should be able to figure out the user's uh, login name out of the event logs. If you know that, then you can iterate their desktop.ini file. The desktop.ini file will tell you what files they have on their desktop. And then from there, you can start pulling whatever files you want off their desktop that may be interesting. If they're logged in as admin, which more often than not seems to be the case, then you can also grab the SAM backup, which will contain the, pass the password hashes of the logged in user. So then you could crack their hashes and log into their own machine. Or you could grab the, um, the backup of the registry, which would also have lots of very inf interesting information about the attacker's machine. I know these are just some ideas, some things you can do with that bug. Uh, the next up on the list was uh, PlugX, also known as Core Plug or Desk Story. Uh, this is another screenshot of it. Uh, again, one victim, and when you click on a victim, you get this second pop-up window, and each one of those tabs is this different set of features that you can pick on in your victim. It's a little bit more feature-rich than the last tool we talked about, and this one is, seems to be more exclusively used by nation states only. It doesn't seem to be one that's available uh, on the black market or publicly, so it's in the hand of a small set of groups, uh, most of the time uh, cited to Asia-Pacific attackers when it's uh, mentioned. Uh, some of the cool features is it actually can, if you have a SQL database, it will be able to map the SQL database, uh, Telnet, you can do RDP sessions. And it is cited in a lot more nation state attacks. Um, one of the biggest reports was this a Black Hat paper a few years ago named I Know You Wanna, 
I know you want me unplugging PlugX, which goes into the, the, the details of different versions, where it's been used, and who's it been used to attack. But like I said, it's very popular with Asia uh, Asian region attacking groups. And this code, um, this one I started out fuzzing. I don't have source code for that one. So I just started fuzzing it, trying to find out what bugs I could. And as I fuzzed it, it actually would crash so many times that I didn't have a good idea where to start with my fuzzing because it was so flaky. So I, started, I went back, I fell back to static analysis. And um, here's a function I found inside the code. This is the function when it receives a packet or a message from the target, then it parses the message and it wants to make sure that the message size is less than F0000, which is really big. But if it's not smaller than that, if it's not small enough to fit in the buffer, then it'll show you, it'll go down that error path and show you this error message, this PE decode packet message. So it does some sanity checking on the packet. However, this function only happens after it's already copied the memory onto the stack. So it copies the buffer onto the stack and then checks, hmm, will this buffer fit on the stack? At that point, it's too late. I've already corrupted your buffer, right? Like if it's too big, I can already have your buffer overflow so I could gain execution. The only problem with that is, is I will get that pop-up message before it returns. So I can exploit the machine, and when I exploit the machine, it'll show this pop-up to the adversary showing very clearly what's going on, right? Like this error message is very descriptive. And they only have one option. They can click OK. I guess they can click Cancel. But it, it does the same thing. As soon as they acknowledge this box in one way or another, then I get code execution because I've overwritten the stack. And then once they get that, then I can do whatever. So I have a demo of this one because it's a code execution module. And how this demo set up the right side of the screen would be representing the adversary. And I will start up PlugX there. And the left side of the screen represents the retaliator. I've got Metasploit running there, and my module's loaded in Metasploit. Let's start this up. All right, so I start up the uh, PlugX command and control component, and then my retaliator. I'm just going to assume for now that I already know where my assailant is on the internet. Uh, we'll talk more about how you can find that out later. But I use my PlugX module there. I will set my target address. Now there's, you're going to pause this for just a second. There's actually three different variants of PlugX, and they each one use a slightly different encoding of their packets. I have written my module to support all three types. You can see the available targets up there is PlugX1 old, PlugX1, and then PlugX2. That's the naming convention used by one of those other papers. I just figured I'd stick with it just to be consistent. If you don't know what type your target is, it's fine to, to just try one of them and say check. It won't crash the server. It'll say yes, this is good, or no, it's not. And so you can just try all three until you find which one's the right type that your assailant is, or your adversary is using. So I run check there. It says yes, the target appears to be vulnerable, so I've got the right type. And then I'll run my exploit. You'll see the exploit caused this pop-up message to show up. The adversary is like, what's that? Clicks the message, and as soon as he clicks the message, I've got a session on the attacker's box. So I'm going to pull some sysinfo from the attacker's machine, uh, and launch a shell, and then just as proof, I think I'm going to kick open Notepad on their machine, just to show I have execution on their box. So that's it. You have, uh, we have code execution on the attacker in that case. The third and final tool I wanted to talk about is uh, Ghost Rat. Have any of you, uh, as incident responders, come across a Ghost Rat or heard of Ghost Rat being used? I'm curious. Yes, yes, a few hands. Okay, Ghost Rat has been around for over 10 years. It's been like a staple in the nation state activities. Again, mostly out of Asia, specific region. This tool is kind of like the gold standard when it comes to rats. Like, oh, can your rat do what Ghost can do? Because Ghost is kind of like the basics. Um, here you go, the, the right click menu shows the basic capabilities it has, shows your webcam, captures some audio, capture keys, capture the screen download files, you know, the basic stuff. And like I said, cited in lots of lots of different places. It's been around for quite some time. Uh, most recently is the one down in the bottom left. Uh, even this year, Ghost Rat was being spread via the Eternal Blue exploit. So old rat, new tool, still going there. 
Ghost Rat, like Extreme Rat, has a very signaturable pattern. It always starts out every bite or every packet from the target or from the adversary back and forth starts out with this ghost header spelt with a zero. Now that's a very signaturable um, pattern there. Uh, the, a while ago, the source code for Ghost was leaked online. So a lot of different groups have changed, the, altered the source code, and they know that that byte's very di distinguishable, so they change it to some other five-byte pattern. A colleague of mine, Sonora, this second screenshot here is a list of all the different variants that he's observed out in the wild. Nonetheless, even if you change that five-byte pattern, the next few bytes are still a signaturable pattern. It's like a size and then a, Z li or a, a libz compressed buffer. And so it's still a very signaturable pattern. Right? Five characters of ASCII, a size, and then a zlib header. Um, it's very easy to find this guy. It's still around very much. And like the extreme rat, it also had this very interesting communication. But this time, when it was trying to grab a file from the victim, or from the adversary, excuse me, it would say, hey, I want your file, C drive documents, user file.doc. I'm going to save that to target x slash file.doc. And then the ad target would say, okay, here's the data. Remember, you were going to save that to target x slash doc. And then the server side would then save that data to whatever path is listed there. And so I thought, well, what if I just send it the data and send it a path and say, oh, hey, here's the data. And um, remember, you were going to save this to a startup, yeah, program startup folder. Yeah, you were going to save this executable right there, please. And then it would save it there. And then the next time the machine starts up, it would run this executable, and then I'd have execution. Now, that's kind of a cool bug. However, the startup path is different for different versions of Windows. So it's kind of hard to reliably get execution via that way. I wanted something better. Um, so I kept looking. And uh, GhostRat itself is vulnerable to a DLL sideload. So a DLL sideload means that if there's a DLL that matches the pattern it's looking for in the current directory, then it'll grab that one instead of the system one out of the system directory. So if we set a file named oledlg.dll in the same directory as the ghost rat itself, then it will load that file when ghost rat starts up instead of the system one that it's supposed to grab. And it's only going to grab one function out of that DLL. So we just need to make a simple function called OLE UI busy, which basically just asks, is it all right if I make the UI busy? So it's a very simple function. All you have to do is say, yes, it's OK. All the time, we just make a function that always returns true. And then Ghost will load and run just normal. It won't even notice that it's got the wrong library. And then we can add to our library whatever functionality we want, like code execution or a backdoor or whatever we need. So that's a cool bug. However, again, that requires Ghost to be restarted before I actually get execution. So again, not good enough. I had a personal vendetta against Ghost, and I wanted something better. So I kept looking. And like I said, Ghost, the source code for that's online. So that made my bug hunting a lot easier since I had the source code and didn't have to work in assembly. And I found these two lines in the source code. The first line here sets this MB remote drive list buffer to zero, and it sets it based on the size of the buffer. But then the next line copies into that buffer another buffer that it got from the target, and it copies in the buffer size as the size it got from the target. So it doesn't check that the buffer I'm handing it is small enough to fit in the buffer it's given. That buffer is actually the list of drives the victim's machine has. So it expects there to be, at most, 26 drives. You know, most computers only have, Windows computers have like three drives. So it's like, okay, well, a thousand characters should be enough space to hold all 26 drives. But they never actually check if somebody decides to send them 2,000 drives in the list. And so I can send it a huge buffer there and overwrite this structure. Now, this structure is part of a C++ class. It's actually on line 45 there. You can see the buffer, and it's 1,024 characters. So when I overwrite that, I start overwriting the things in the structure below this. Um, and so to get execution, this then gets kind of ugly. I can overwrite, you can see these C image stars. Those are pointers to another class. I can overwrite one of them, but then that's just a pointer to another class. So when, they, when the code tries to run this, it's going to call that class a function off of that, which is like a pointer to a pointer. Um, 
in, ex in exploitation world, that's kind of rough. You have a pointer to a pointer. That means you need to be able to control, you need to know where something is in memory to point your execution to, which is kind of messy. Um, I'm sure if I spent a lot more time looking, I could have found another bug that kind of did some address disclosure and let me know where I was in memory. But I took the lazy man's approach and I did a heap spray. I would send them enough packets that I knew I was pretty much all over this memory range so that I could just jump somewhere there and more than likely land in, some, in, a, in a NOP sled or something that I could use to gain execution. Um, data execution prevention, DEP, would disable, would break this trick. Um, most processors have that capability. However, the process, the application that's running must opt in. And GhostRat itself, I have not seen a build has, that's been opt in to DEP. Furthermore, I tried enabling it myself and it, the process crashes. So I don't think Ghost is even capable of running with DEP on. So I didn't even need to worry about that defeat in my exploit here. Um, before I continue, um, there I wanted to bring out or highlight some work uh, Kevin the Hermit has done. He has written some scripts which will, if you found the malware piece to any one of, to some of these toolkits, uh, Ghost, Extreme Rat, Poison Ivy, it will extract from that malware piece the C2 information. It will strap, extract the config information. So if you have the malware sample, you can run the script and say, oh, this malware piece was designed to call home to this address on this port at this time. And so you can then use this information to find your targets, right? If you've been targeted with this malware, you find the malware, you run the script, now you know who your assailant is and we can attack them back. However, if you don't want to wait until you've been attacked first, Shodan has recently added a new feature called their Malware Hunter, which scans the web looking for, among other things, ghost servers. So we can quickly, in Shodan, do a search for ghost rat servers. We now have an exploit for ghost rat servers, and we can just start poning adversaries, if you consider them adversaries at that point. Now, obviously, there's a huge legal and ethical problem with that, but it's, it's feasible. So with that, I want to show, let's show a demo of the ghost rat bug. Again, same setup, the adversary is on the right, the retaliator is on the left. This time I'm going to do it a little differently. This time I'm going to have the adversary build a piece of malware and deliver that to the target. So here I am with using the ghost CNC server to create a malware piece. I save it to the desktop, then I stupidly close the rat and to move the file out. I'll pause this real quick. So I just dragged the file out of the VM. Obviously, that's not how it works in the real world. In the real world, he probably sends a phishing email with the executable attached. We, we all know how phishing emails work. Somehow or another, let's just assume that the piece of malware ended up on the attack on the target's machine and the retaliator got a hold of it. So now I'm going to use the scripts that I talked about against that sample. And it'll show me, oh, look, that you're, it's meant to call home to this IP address on port 80. Uh, I realized that the uh, CNC server wasn't listening, so I started it back up. Here I'm starting Metasploit. I'm going to use my ghost rat module now, and I'm going to point it at that IP address that I extracted from the malware itself, and we'll target that guy. So starting my module, setting the target. Just do basic info, make sure everything looks good. We'll run a check to verify that the server's server's up and we can contact it. Yep, appears to be vulnerable. We'll run the exploit. Now, because I'm doing a heap spray, it's gonna take a little while because I'm throwing lots and lots of data, filling up a huge block of memory just to make sure I've got a, a nice big landing pad for my exploit. The next in the exploit, we can see the session starting up. Um, not sure why it's taking a second here, but Meterpreter's thinking about it. And boom, we have a interpreter session. We can pull sysinfo again on the target, spawn a shell, and then this time as proof, I think I, I spawned calc. Boom, I have calc on the adversary's machine there. So, you have a shell on a bad guy. Now what? What would what, what you do from this point? To be, I'm not sure what you should do at this point, but I have some suggestions of what I would recommend would be fun. Um, first off, running Netstat would be very interesting because Netstat would show what other connections that this attacker has made. If they have any other victims, you could see the, your victims' IPs. And so you could get a better idea of what industries or what areas may be targeted. You may know if you have any other machines compromised by this attacker by looking at that IP list. 
Also, you might be able to tell if they're RDPing into this box or if they have um, different methods of accessing it. You obviously want to start walking the file system, see what files they've pulled from you or maybe other victims. We can turn, learn what industries they're interested in, what kind of files they're after. Are they after source code? Are they after you know, uh, financial information? Are they, what are they after? Um, maybe you want to install your own persistence on their machine so you can get back on this later. You can watch them for a while. Maybe you want to install a key logger to see where else they go. Maybe they'll log into Facebook. Maybe you can identify them that way. Maybe you want to steal their credentials and start enumerating and pivoting through their network. Uh, a lot of options at this point. Not a lot of this has been discussed publicly, publicly, which is very interesting considering we're on the verge of a law being proposed to make this legal. We probably ought to talk about what we should do with it after that fact, before that fact. Um, however, whatever you decide to do, I highly recommend you sit quiet and listen and not go after damage. This is supposed to be an ASCII art picture of Sun Tzu there, but um, clearly just sitting watching, watching our adversaries is probably the best bet for us learning how better to defend against them. With that, I thank you for attending my talk. Um, if you have any questions or anything about this, feel free to hit me up either afterward or I have some spare time now, so thank you very much. <laughs> questions? Cool. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference.